Good morning, this is Mr. Riley. I'm going to go ahead and lecture on chapter four. So I'm going to go ahead and take screens, application window, and hopefully you're seeing my screen. I will take a quick look here and see. There we go. Good. Okay. So uh, this chapter is on physical security and how it affects you as an ethical hacker. Because sometimes you'll actually be doing a physical security check on a project. So see if you can actually get in to a facility and stuff like that. So, so uh, the role of physical security, how it plays into this, common controls we use in physical security, physical access controls and biometrics, avoiding threats to physical security and defense in depth. So some basic concept controls. You put passwords on PCs so people can't get access to them. Make sure they have screensaver. So after so long, it goes to screensaver if you get up and walk away without logging off. But my recommendation is hit the Windows L like in a Windows machine or just log off. Hard drive and mobile device encryption. That's the bit locker that we learned in 2601. That basically, if you lose a laptop, they can't just crack it with like, you know, Kali Linux or, you know, uh, Hiron's Boot CD or something like that. Controls for printer, scanners, fax machines, and voice over IP. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So hard drive and mobile encryption. You, uh, regular encryption, you can encrypt files, folders, entire hard disks. Like the files and folders would be your encrypted file system like in Windows EFS. Full disk protection applies to the entire volume. My recommendation, if you do that, do that like on a D drive where your data is, or you can do it on the C drive, but you have to leave a little portion unencrypted so the machine can boot, but that's all part of the process of doing encryption with BitLocker. Uh, you can use software encryption, pretty good privacy for encrypting email, TrueCrypt, BitLocker. These are like third-party softwares. And I already kind of touched on BitLocker and EFS. They come with the OS. Okay, once you're done with a computer and you want to pull your hard drive out, you need to wipe the drive. That's, you know, erase everything on it. Zeroization is where you change it all to either zeros or ones. And degaussing is where you demagnetize it. That's how you sanitize the drive. Uh, some of the security issues with printers and faxes. They weren't designed for security in mind. They're designed to work, you know, to communicate. Data, data transmission is unprotected, so you may look into encryption for that. Documents sit in a tray while, you know, what you usually don't have, everybody doesn't have a fax machine on their desk, so it may be in a common area. So you have to either be waiting for it or it could be just sitting in the tray. Documents stored in memory and can be re reprinted later because there is actually memory in every printer, fax machine, so can easily review device history and see what was sent and received or printed. Even if you're not seeing the data, you can see where it came from. You can kind of like patch together that. You know, I received an email from, you know, Joe Smith or something like that. Voice over IP allows telephone calls over Ethernet network, right? Voice signals can be transmitted as data packets. It's susceptible to the same attacks that affect regular data transmissions. If they're encapsulating it the same way as data packets with data, voice can be, you know, attacked the same way. Phone calls can be intercepted and captured, so we can capture your VoIP packets and listen in, or trans, you know, translate it later. Okay, with physical area controls, we have perimeter intrusion detection and assessment. PIDAS. You can use, you know, that would be like intrusion detection systems and stuff like that. Fences, gates, bollards are, that's not a real common word, but a bollard is like those posts around like the gas pumps or in front of Target and store. So people can't drive a car up into it. And here's some uh, different types of fences. You got type A, B, C, and D and E and extremely high security where the mesh is very small where you can it's very hard to climb it's very thick so it's hard to cut and so on and normal fencing would be like two inch holes between each 
fence things. So actually those are kind of used to climb or you see around like a ball, baseball field. Uh, with a facility, you can have some controls like guards and dogs. Like if at GCC, we actually have guard, you know, security guards downstairs. Doors, man traps, and turnstiles, that's where you can control access as you go in like into the subway and stuff like that, one person at a time. Wall ceilings and floors, you need to have the walls go all the way from the floors to the ceiling. If you have a raised floor, make sure it is controlled. In windows construction, if they can get break a window or something like that or break in that way. A couple different types of doors, you have industrial doors, vehicle access doors, you can have bulletproof all doors or vault doors. I've actually worked with the industrial and the vault doors where they're actually, you know, two sheets of steel with concrete poured in there. I worked in a vault before. Man traps replaces a single door with a phone size booth space with a door on each side. So one person at a time can go through and if they don't get cleared, then they get locked into the booth. Turnstiles used to slow the flow of traffic to ensure individuals are screened and authenticated prior to entering an area. Commonly used sporting events, subways, amusement parks. Wall ceilings and floors, you have a reinforced walls made to deter attacks from entering through the defined door. Like just a sheetrock wall or you know plaster wall you could knock through. Avoid using false walls. But walls should run from the floor, the slab, to the roof. That way they can't like push up the drop ceiling and climb over. Use solid versus hollow wall construction. Ceilings should meet all weight bearing loads and fire specifications. And raised floors should be grounded and non-conducting. Walls should be extended below the false floor. So if you have a false floor, which is common like in IT, you can have a raised floor so you can run all your cabling underneath there. Have the regular walls go all the way to the real floor underneath. Windows, you have standard, carbon acrylic, wire reinforced, and right here actually it shows you the different you know standard lowest level of protection they're easily cheap and shattered and when they can be shattered or destroyed polycarbonate much stronger than standard glass this type of plastic offers superior protection wire reinforces where it actually like if you hit it it may crack but it doesn't shatter laminate similar to the automobile glass solar film provides a moderate level of security decreased shatter potential and security film used to increase strength of glass in case of breakage or explosion. Okay, guards and dogs. If you have guards and dogs, um, they come with additional costs because you're paying the guards. You have to have someone handle the dogs and stuff like that. And most of the time you don't have the dogs mixed with the people. They're out on the perimeter. You make sure that you have good background checks on them because you don't want to have someone to apply for the job as the guard and be the one who wants to steal from you or, you know, hack into you. Uh, they usually monitor close circuit TV, premise control equipment, any intrusion detection systems you may have. And dogs provide perimeter security, usually restricted to exterior premises only. Uh, construction, design, functionality some of the physical security concerns. You need to basically make sure you plan during the construction of a new building to have these physical security things in place. Um, there could be vandalism, natural or plan for natural environmental concerns, vandalism like location of the building, proximity to hazards. Are you near like a nuclear power plant or a river that floods every 10 years? If there's any crime rate in the area. And how close are you to emergency services like the fire department, the police department, stuff like that? Because actually that also affects your insurance too. Uh, personal safety controls, like for the parking lot, make sure there's good lighting, closed circuit TV, any alarms. Because you also, one of your assets is your personnel. So you want to make sure they're safe. Lighting, you can have continuous lighting, fixed lighting arranged by flood, an area with light, like you see like in a parking lot. Standby, randomly turns on to create an impression of activity. That's where like 
the building where you see lights come on and off all night long. Movable, manually operated, movable searchlights like you see like in a guard tower. And emergency lights can duplicate all previous lights, must have alternate power source. So like if you lose power like in a hospital, certain lights turn on and those are your emergency lights and they run off the generator. And we have the same thing in the school system. Alarms and intrusion detection provides alerts for fires, carbon monoxide and potential intrusions. May have audible and visual alerts. So, you know, the, the alarms are going off. Should have capability to contact remote resources. So like if you have a fire alarm go off, it should also be contacting the fire department. If you have an intrusion detection system go off, also have a contact the police. False alarms can be an issue. So like if something can trip it and be like a false positive, you don't want that. Uh, closed circuit TV, remote monitoring usually works in conjunction with guards, provides ability to see what is occurring in different locations. In place of surveillance devices, consider factors such as how well is it lighted for that camera? What type of lens do you have? How far depth of field do you get from it? And how far can you focus in on? So you want to have good cameras because now something you got to take in consideration. If you're taping this, if you're recording this, it's going to take up hard drive space. So in doing this, if you have high quality, it's going to take up more disk space. So plan for that. Uh, physical access controls, you can have locks, tokens, and biometrics. So how do you get into a door? Is it a regular key lock? Do you use tokens, biometric? So with locks, you have two types. Your regular put a key in, pin and tumbler. Cypher, that's where you have a keypad and you touch in numbers. Um, some different types of lock picking. You have tension wrenches. That's where you slide a wrench in there and hold tension to it, like the key turning, similar to an angled flathead screwdriver. And with the picks, similar to a dentist pick, and then that's what you kind of go along the tumblers on and see if you can get it to, to release. Tokens and biometrics, actively active electronics, access card has the ability to transmit electronic data. Electronic circuit, access card has electronic circuit embedded. That would be like your little chip. Magnetic strip, access card has a strip of magnetic material. And contactless, con, contactless card, access card communicates with reader electronically. And that's how like my badge allows me to get into the classrooms and stuff like that. Biometrics, you have like fingerprint, hand geometry, palm scanner, retina scan, iris recognition, that's with the, you know, retina and iris is with the eye, voice recognition when you're talking, and keyboard dynamics, which is interesting because actually everybody has their own way of typing, you know, how fast they type, they call that flight time, and dwell time is how long your fingers stay on the keys. So that can actually be recorded and they can actually use that to determine who's been on the keyboard. Avoiding common threats to secure physical security, natural and human technical threats, you know, like have antivirus, have guards, you know, don't be built in a flood zone. Physical keystroke loggers where you can actually have someone put a key logger on your keyboard and record all your keystrokes. Sniffers, that's be like your wire shark. Actually, they sniff packets and capture packets. Wireless interception and rogue access points. That's where someone can actually set up a rogue access point and people start communicating through that thinking they're talking to the right access point. Natural and human and technical threats. You have theft, vandalism, destruction, terrorism, like if we are like at an embassy and stuff, or accidents can happen, you know, like if a tree falls on your building or something like that. Physical keystroke loggers and sniffers. Keystroke loggers, physical device used to record everything a person types on the keyboard. Keyboard cables inside keyboards or software system. That's where, you know, you can have a software or you can have a, a hardware one. 
Sniffers, it's a passive sniffing relies on the promiscuous motor network card. Actually, you guys have done this in your labs and you basically start capturing packets and stuff like that. Active sniffing relies on injection packets into the network. And this should all look familiar to you. Wireshark, you know, it's capturing packets. And this is a very popular one. Wireless interception and rogue access points. Blue jacking, that's where. Bluetooth uh, hijacking, eavesdropping, where you're listening to people's conversation. If people have open authentication. I thought there might be something there. Open authentication on a Wi-Fi. If you could set up a rogue access point. Denial of service by blocking other people or setting up a false access point and basically, you know, denying people access that way. Defense in depth based on a concept of layering more than one control. Controls can be physical, administrative, or technical in design. So we talked about that in earlier chapters. Administrative is your policies. Your physical is your doors, locks, facility. And your technical would be your configurations on your routers, IDSs, switches, Strive for a minimum of three layers. First layer, now we're just talking about the physical physical controls here. Building perimeter. Second layer, building exterior roof, walls, floors, and ceiling. Make sure they're secure, not easily breached. And third layer, interior controls, locks, safes, containers, cabinets, and interior lighting. Also, the administrative controls about this is how long do you keep this material? How do the people treat the material when they're using it or processing it? Your regular workers and stuff. When it is no longer needed, how long until you destroy it? You know, stuff like that. So how long is it kept around? It doesn't need to be archived, you know. Okay. And that completes uh, Chapter 4. Okay. Thank you.